which is line with the one. Ten millions, back with the ten. Hundred million. Uh, no matter hundred, I'm out here as far out as I can get. That's why we say a hundred percent, because it's the full capacity, is what a hundred is. And ultimately, um, that is what mo numbers are modeling. They are actually real. They are emanations. And they're showing how reality is spread out, how it's given a metric. Um, it's showing how everything is sorted by this vortex, by this energy. So we, again, just accounting for our powers of 10 there is a function of our halving, um, which is precisely related to our reciprocals, to our doubling, to our family number groups, all of those interwoven into this one symbol. I could go on and on for days about this symbol and all the things you can do with it. I will say this final thing before we move on. Whenever you get stuck in the math, go back to your symbol. If it doesn't work in the symbol, then you need to think it through more. You gotta find the deeper connection of what's going on here. <coughs> this symbol has all the information that you're ever gonna get in any stage of the math which is going to get highly complex and I hope to eventually be revealing that. So this was everything I had to say for right now on our symbol of enlightenment and now we're going to move on to the next step. Okay, so we've had a fairly thorough going over of this symbol, symbol of enlightenment. This is the mathematical decryption of the most great name of God. Uh, it's another topic I like to talk a lot about, but I want to just stay focused on the math right now. From here, we're going to change to something a little different. But we have to keep in mind all the principles we've discussed so far, because what this symbol explains, now we're going to show in a whole new way that's going to lead to us being able to model true 3D reality. And what we're going to do is take this numerology of this symbol and turn it into something called quantum numerology. Um, like as in quantum mechanics, as in, as in quantizing or giving a spatial or a tile or a, a value or an amount to any of these numbers. And to find the true secret of what I meant when I was talking about angle and ratio, how that works in three dimensions. So we can quantize numbers in any of our geometric shapes that we're working with, whether it's the triangle, um, the hexagon, the diamond. Of course, the nine is the source of everything, so we're going to start by talking about the diamond, by quantizing numbers in diamonds. Now, you may be confused at what I'm talking about right now. So let me bring up this to help. This symbol, let me say the first thing, is incorrect because what you're seeing here is squares. I did it that way because this was graphed out and it was easier to do. It really should be diamonds. They should really be like this, and these lines should truly be coming at an angle. But you don't need to worry too much about that right now. I'm going to explain it to you as we go. This beautiful chart is the quantizing of numbers, giving each diamond tile a number, uh, a function and a value, a quality and a quantity. With this map, you can model all the principles of physics. You can reveal the true secret of the atom. And all that we're going to go over. So let's just take a look at what we have going on over here, and then I'm going to do something really impressive. I'm going to turn it into a 3D object. If you notice, again, I said this should be at an angle, so really going up like this should be vertical. Now my multiplication tables I was modeling before, I'm modeling now here in this interconnected series. Let's start here. There's a 1 right here. If I go up, notice I'm going multiples of 1. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So that means here's my 9. So there must be a mirror image uh, with the 8s going down. 8, 
seven, six, five, four, three, two. Right? So this, my one and eight polar number pair, are modeling my vertical axis. This system obsoletes the Cartesian coordinate system and shows how to model a true 3D. How about if I go this way? This would really be my horizontal, again, if I was at that angle. If I start with 5, I have 5, 10, 15 to 6, 20, 25, 30, 35. Multiples of 5 going this way. Again, there's my 9. I must have multiples of 4 going this way. 4, 8, 12, which is 3, 16, 7, 20, 2, 24, there's 6. So multiples of 1 and 8 are my vertical axis. Multiples of 4 and 5 are my horizontal axis. Everything around this 9. Notice here I have 6 and 3, 2 and 7, 1 and 8, 4 and 5. All the polar number pairs positioned around my 9. This red 9 is a positive 9. Okay. So my 1 and 8's are my vertical, my 4 and 5's are my horizontal. But then what about my 2 and 7? Where is that? Well, you see, well, there's 2 and 7 here. Is it this? Well, no, those aren't multiples of 2 or 7. 2, 5, 6, no, 7, 4, 3. No, that doesn't work, so it's not that. My z-axis is actually coming from the inside out. The 7 and 2, which is the z-axis here, are coming out, piercing through the skin. They're emanations. They're invisible, but you can see them by the way that they're displacing the other numbers. And I'm going to show you that, but I'm going to, I want to show you some other things first. What are other things we're looking for here? Well, I notice if I come this way, I've got my doubling. 1, 2, 4, 8, 7, 5. 1, 2, 4, 8. And if I go this way, I've got doubling going the other direction. 1, 2, 4, 8, 7, 5. Or I could say I have halving. Right? They're both going on at the same time. These are mirror image doubling circuits. We call them circuits because through doubling, all vibration is passed in anything with mass. So all material is moving. When you make electrical coils, these can be circuits. All right? So I have doubling going this way, doubling going that way. And then notice what's in between them. My 9, 3, 3, 9, 6, 6, 9, 3, 3. The multiplication series of my 3, 6, and 9, or the doubling of my 3, 6, and 9, making this. And notice what happens. The 6, the 3, and the 6, they never touch. Right? They're just like magnetic poles. They repel each other. Okay? So that's very um, important to recognize. In between the 3 and 6, there's always a 9. Okay? There's never a 3 and 6 connecting where there's not a 9 in between them. The 9 is the control for everything. Also here, if I take in this group of 9 tiles, I have 1, 2, 4, 8, 7, 5. Another vortice here. Remember, we were talking about the vortex. But we'll wait till we look at the 3D model to show what that really is. I just want you to see that I've got my vertical, I've got my horizontal. When I said you can see uh, my z-axis by how it's displacing everything, what did I mean? I mean by the numbers surrounding a number. Let's take a 1, for instance. This is a positive 1. Okay? So an etheron is emanating out from the center. It's activating this number. Well, let's look at the numbers around it. Now, if we're talking about multiples of 7, and I'm lining it up with my 1, then I know it's going to be 7 here. So, if I look here, 5 plus 2 is 7. 6 and 1 is 7. All right? And then I have 9 plus 2 is 2. 5 and 6 is 2. So, 2 and 7 are shown by the way those numbers are surrounding it. You could do that, um, let's say, if I'm doing 4, then I would be... I would be 1 and 8 would be, because 1 would be the multiple in that series of 7 piercing through the 4. Probably no one's going to follow what I'm saying here, but you can see still I predicted it would be 1 and 8. You have 7 and 3 is 10 is 1, 8 and 2 is 1. 
that 9 and 8 is 8, 5 and 3 is 8. All right, so I can do that for any number and show how the values are intersecting. And when that works, it makes this whole skin vibrate and channel motion. So before I get back to this, let me just show you ultimately what that turns into. This is called the torus, the toroid. Okay, there's a lot of different names for it. This is this, a coil. It's a sunflower. This is the shape uh, in this system of the universe. It's modeling this compression, decompression. So when you build a torus mathematically, all you're showing on your vertical axis, multiples of 1 and 8, you got your 4 and 5 on your horizontal. Really, this is just one torus. There's other ways to build them, but I'm going to stick with my 1 and my one and 8 is my control. So I have 1 and 8 on the horizontal, 4 and 5, and I've got doubling moving at angular motion. Just like on my symbol, the doubling circuits, it's probably a little hard to see in some of these. Like here would be 1, moving in at an angle towards the center. Here's my linear energy coming out from the center, moving in straight lines. Notice every number it's activating is separated by thirds, which again is probably a little hard to see in this model, but you have 5, 6, 7, 8. This is my 2, 5, and 8 family number group, the moment when it's activated. So you can have your, you have a moment for the 147s, a moment for the 258s, a moment for the 396. It's like a pulsing, it's a phasing or a sequence order. So 2, 5, and 8, they're all separated by thirds. They're separated by thirds on their vertical axis. They're separated by thirds on their horizontal axis. They're separated by thirds on the z-axis. Okay, because the z-axis is this emanation coming out, giving the number its positive polarity sign symbol, and causing a negative backdraft coming back this way, which is gravity which is entraining everything inwards. And when we talk about entraining, synchronization, that's created by this energy deflecting everything, causing it to vibrate and to center itself around a, a, around a center of gravity, you could say. That's why you always have a center of gravity. Again, just so you can look, here's the DNA symbol, and you can see that initial symbol of enlightenment right in here. 1, 2, 4, 8, 7, 5, and here's your 9, 3, 6. You can actually see it in the DNA, but we're not going to go into that right now. So, this ultimately makes the shape of the universe. The Big Bang is just one explosion coming out, eventually curving back around and imploding at the top, where it's concentrating all its heat and literally squeezing the energy out, emanates back out, re-enlivening everything. Out of that, you can design a coil. Now, the coil that I'm designing now is a little bit different than the standard coil. Whoops, I lost that one. So we're talking about the torus. This, again, is a version looking from the top half of a torus. You can see these doubling circuits curving in, moving at an angle forming a vortex. This is why in relativity everything warps and curves. It's warping and curving around a linear imagery, uh, sorry, a linear energy which is imparting to everything its geometric structure and function. Everything is composed of really two aspects, form and function, and that's what mathematics is all about modeling. So here's another picture of a torus. This is the southern half now. Uh, notice it's in a mirror image. The northern half curving in counterclockwise, imploding. The southern half exploding clockwise. And it's still the same one-way motion, but its overarching curvature is now inverted on the southern half. So just like in my symbol, when my number is inverted, that is preserved in the torus. And so this is the torus skin. All right, it's composed. You have to have interlocking multiplication tables. Again, this is just with my control as one. You always have to have doubling, and you always want this 396 to be in between your two pathways of doubling. 
So what I have here, my red nines and threes and sixes, we're going to say are positive. My black ones are negative. Now notice if I'm moving at an angle, I'm preserving positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. Okay. Binary flip-flop. Also, as I go from one group here to the next, you can see I've got a positive 9, and, there's a, and my 3 and 6 are negative, and I've got a negative 9, my 6 and 3 are positive. And they're mirror image, inversions. Here I've got 1, 2, 4, and now my 1, 2, 4 is over here. 8, 7, 5 here, 8, 7, 5 here. And the 6's and the 3's, they're opposed. So they're forming flip-flopping mirror images. So we're going to have three different stages. One's going to be my red stage. One's going to be my green stage. One's going to be my blue stage. Notice that I'm modeling family number groups. There's only two different kinds of these groups you can have, which gives you, again, 18 numbers. All right? positive and negative for each number. On this doubling circuit, my 1, 4s and 7s are positive, and my 2, 8s and 5s are negative. On this doubling circuit, my 2, 8s and 5s are positive, and 1, 4s and 7s are negative. So in my first sequence, I start with a positive 9. What that means is that the, this energy is shooting out of the center. You can say the nucleus or the very center where everything is condensed down, its heat is concentrated, they say that near the center of a black hole, 100 million suns is the size of a pinhead. That's how dense it is. Okay? And all that heat and that density of matter, and I believe actually the fastest thing traveling through the universe is not light, because even in that black hole where the light cannot escape, sound is being emitted, radiated. And so sound, which we know propagates faster through more dense material, sound moving through that density of matter is faster than even light. And this is sound at its perfect resonance. So in my first group, my 9 is positive when it's emanating out. My 3 and 6 are negative. They're going towards the center. All right? And that would be in this vortice here. And the one next to it on either side of it. Okay, you could say this is a trinity here. On either side, I have a negative 9. And I have 6 and 3 coming out. For every action, there are two half-opposite reactions, a modification of Newton's law. All right, so there is my first stage. And as I move along my circuit, I'm still preserving that positive, negative, positive, negative. For every etheron that comes out, we have two parts magnetism that react to it instantaneously. That's why magnetism is the fastest, and it's the control for electricity. These doubling circuits modeling motion vibration, which is all electricity is, electrons moving through a wire, are showing now two electrical moments, two moments of activation. One is my 1, 4s, and 7s. Notice if I go on my horizontal, 1, 2, 3, there's a 4. I can go 1, 2, 3, 7, 3. If those numbers are separated by thirds on my horizontal, one, two, three, one, two, three. All my greens are separated by thirds. But going at an angle, they're one, two, you know, they're every other one. They're positive, negative, positive, negative. So as this energy is synchronizing every different axis, it's actually creating a flow, a motion. So I go first, my 3, 9, and 6 are all positive, negative. Next, my 1, 4 is a 7. And on the next one, my 2, 5, and 8. So it's a 1, 2, 3 sequence, a three part sequence. Again, family number group 1 is a 3, 9, 6. Family number group 2, 1, 4, and 7. Family number group 3, 2, 8, and 5. This is essential to understand for understanding how to perfectly model compression and decompression, no matter what you're talking about, no matter what the medium. These doubling circuits are the pathways of motion. Okay, so we feel pretty comfortable with that now. Each time one of those emanations comes out, here's another example. You can see my reds there 
emanating out, causing the blues to come in. So this is an example in my, I'm showing my yellow, my yellows here are the numbers that are activated. All right, this is the southern half. So these emanations coming out are activating those and in every other one sequence, it's entraining matter in this way, entraining motion. What's the cutting edge on the top and there's the trailing edge on the other side totally reverses. The cutting edge on the top becomes the trailing edge on the bottom. Um, so, in every way, just like our three and six, the three representing the coming in, the top northern male half, the six representing the female birth giving southern half, they're always mirror images. It's a very important principle in this math. So, when we take these numbers and then we start to model a torus, the question is, what are we really looking at? Up until now, um, the model for the torus and how to design a coil has been based on this model. Whoops. And what we're going to have to do is take groups of nine and link them together so that they form unbroken circles, so that I have a 1 and 8 as a circle, both positive and negative. Um, just like here, I have my positive numbers going up here, and then going in the opposite direction, my black ones are negative, but the same multiplication series, 1 and 8. And then 4 and 5, it's the same, I've got my positive ones, these are negative. So every other one is positive and negative, which is causing, allowing that uh, binary motion to go on along the doubling circuits. And also, there's never any more of any number than any other number. They're always in exact proportion. All right? And so the smallest I can have to make a toroid is a 9 by 9, and I'm going to show how that works. I was never understood until I did the work on it to actually show how to map a true torus. When you're making these toruses, the standard way that people have been winding the coil is based on the family number groups along just a, a flat series of 1 to 36. So this is only accounting really for a single horizontal axis. So in this one is going 1 to 16, which is 7, you know. And I'm going back up here to 31, which is 4. So I've gone 1, 7, 4. On my third one, I'm at a right angle to the first one, and that's 10. Again, back to 1. 25, which is 7. 4, which is 4. 19, which is 1. Again, at a right angle to that last one. Everything's always at a right angle, so it's moving in a star shape. Notice you have parallel lines. Any way you go, you can make any of these parallel lines. So there are these parallel fields going on. And this winding in the star shape is referred to as spires. There are the family number groups crossing over each other in a triangulated sequence. This as a coil is built from two wires. One is the green wire, which is wrapping back around until it connects to itself. So if you want to see the pads, it's going one, two, three, one, two, three, two, three, one, two, and then back to where it started. Okay, the orange is your two, five, and eights, and those are moving in a mirror image direction. And then you have a space for your three, nines, and six, which is your yellow there. That space allows this etheron flux magnetic field to occur which is supposed to pull the electricity and train it and synchronize it so that it moves at its fastest acceleration possible, making what's called an electrical venturi, an electrical vortex. Um, over the surface of this are supposed to be these smaller 1, 2, 4, 8, 7, 5s. One, here's a pot, here's a negative vortex going in because my 9 is positive, so when my 9 is coming out, the 3 and 6 are going in and they're entraining this vortex in. Where my negative 9 is, I have a positive vortex coming out. 
and they're actually shearing against each other, which brings me to another important point. So I have two different vortices over the surface. If you want an analogy, that's what these are. They're like dimples on a golf ball. They're like sunspots. Okay? We call them underpinned nested vortices. You can call them Coriolis forces. Um, they entrain everything. And they have a sequence order and a flow to how they work. And I discovered actually how that works. So, when a 9 is coming out, we have a vo negative vortice going in. So the polarity of the vortice is opposite the polarity of your actual center number. If the number is positive, the vortice is negative. If the number is negative, the vortice is positive flowing out. And these, are, these vortices increase the acceleration of the flow of electricity by pulling it and entraining it. The idea being that pull is stronger than push. Implosion always must precede explosion, even when you're igniting gasoline and, and such things. So, um, the other important point that I wanted to make is, we, if we go back to our symbol now, we look for all our principles. We've got, we've got multiplication series as circles, even though this is on a flat piece of paper, really there would be circles, a vertical axis, a horizontal axis, okay, then a z-axis going straight. So we have multiplication tables of circles, we have multiplication series of straight lines, we have doubling, unbroken doubling circuits, of course, we haven't proved they're unbroken yet, but we're going to show that. We have doubling circuits going this way. So we're counting. You could say if you look at the one overarching direction, you're accounting for both doubling and halving as the principle. Now, ideally, these tiles would be getting bigger and smaller because they actually expand and contract. But that depends on what, uh, what your numerical system is that you're using. So that's a little more advanced. So when we're working with the numbers like this. We've accounted for the multiplication series. We have doubling. We have our etheron flux magnetic field. We have family number groups. We have all the activation series. What about reciprocals? Remember I said my control is one. Let's look on the other side. Now we've been looking at these groups, which is everything centered on the nine. And these are the main groups. Everything is always spinning around nine. It's always your axis. What I also have, though, is this relationship here. The 1 and the 1, the 2 and the 5, 7, 4, 8 and 8, which are our reciprocals that we learn on our symbol. 1 times 1 is 1. 2 times 5 is 10 is 1. 7 times 4 is 28, which is 1. 8 times 8 is 64, which is 1. On and on. You can do that on this side. You can do that on this side. That is precisely what is contributing to everything being in these groups centered around your 3, 9, and 6, spe specifically the 9, because they're creating a shear. It's called a shear. If you want an explanation of a shear, you spin a cylinder around and grab onto it. It's the common explanation. And you'll feel the shear as it's shearing your hand off. If, on the other hand, you're moving at the same speed as that cylinder, you won't feel anything. Okay? Um, a shear is any spinning system, any revolving system, is going to have a boundary condition, a bounded infinity to it. It's going to be centered on an axis, just like our bodies. Okay, so it has mirror symmetry. Now, um, this shear means that you can touch two different wires together, two wires, and they won't short out because their harmonics or resonance is so per perfect. Notice that it's always positive, negative, negative, positive, positive, negative, negative, positive. So they're always creating a perfect, resonant, harmonic shear by the extreme acceleration of motion in one direction while the other one's going in the other direction. They create a world boundary condition. This is highly significant for engineering. So now I've also accounted for my reciprocals. Okay, if I was using a different control for my toroid, I would still have all of these principles. But that is, again, a little more advanced. So, what I discovered is this model 
is accounting for spires, but it is not truly wound according to the nature of a quantized three-dimensional torus. So if we have a torus in 3D where we have all of our axes going, we have unbroken multiplication series, um, no, matter how, no matter what group of nine we're using, we could be using a sheet of nine by nine. Uh, I'm going to show this graphically. We could be using 18 by 18, 27 by 27, 36 by 36. Any group of nine, I'm saying, which was not known until now, that you can make a torus based on any group of nine. And I have the algorithm for how it works. But what I found is that it's not all one circuit. Though these spires do work to interconnect the various circuits and they do polarize the fields. These relationships of the parallel lines of the triangulation and also even mostly importantly here if you can see again I'll follow it, the diamond those overlappings of the, the hexagons, the diamonds, you can see the pentagon in here all those overlapping geometries are highly significant within the torus but they are not showing the path of these doubling circuits in a true 3D so I figured out how to calculate them perfectly in a 3D and what I found is it's not just two conductors even on the smallest possible torus you can make which is a 9 by 9 it is a minimum of six conductors why does that why is that so and what am I talking about so I'm saying when this mathematical fingerprint used to be shown the idea was that or if you look at a torus, let me show you an example. This may be a little confusing to look at, but if you can follow me on the colors here, I'll show you how the idea was, because this was actually an illustration that I did to show how it doesn't work. Um, Let's, this is the way that the coil was said to be wound. And this is not an accurate, perfect torus. It's just one I had to fill in. Um, I, so I would be having a wire coming in here. It would skip four, one, two, three, four. It would come out here. See, that's my next pink. This one was pink. Coming in here on pink. One, two, three, four. This is my next pink. Then I'm going to switch to yellow. It would come around yellow, yellow. Then I would switch to, I believe, green, green, green. And it's going to go orange, orange, orange. And then I'm back to pink. And it cycles again, saying that this was all one interconnected circuit. But I found that it's not. It's actually multiple circuits. And it depends on how many groups of nine you have. So if I was just to account for nine on my horizontal axis, nine numbers on my vertical axis, which means I can connect them in a circle, which is the principle I have to maintain. I have to have a perfect circle on my axis that is one of my multiplication series. And it also has to intersect perfectly with a horizontal axis that's accounting for the right um, opposing multiplication series for that axis. In this case, it's my 1 and 8 and my 4 and 5s. My 2 and 7s are my z-axis. Um, as I make more layers of the skin, th that will switch. This could be 2 and 7 and 1 and 8. Okay. Um, or actually be 8 and 1. But I won't go into that yet. So if you're looking at it on a flat piece of paper, you would say, oh, well, all these green are just one circuit. Um, but they're not. Even on a 9 by 9, so I have nine on my horizontal, nine, nine on my vertical, nine on my horizontal. And I will have uh, also the negative numbers filling in between, which I believe is a total of 162 numbers for a nine by nine. I'm going to uh, show you what that will look like. Let me, let me just pull that out. So this would be an example, and I'm going to explain to you what this is. This is very small, I know, but 
this would be a 9 by 9 torus. All right? It's composed of three what I call nested vortice circuits. What is a nested vortice circuit? We know these vortices over the surface are nested vortices. Um, they are like kickers for the electricity. They impart more atheron energy, the electricity accelerates. There are um, more axes for the electricity to compress and decompress off of, or for any motion to work off of. Now these nested vortices have to function with each other in a sequence. Um, which is over the surface of this whole thing, which is, which is probably the most significant and complex aspect of vortex-based mathematics. I believe it's also the secret to the periodic table, which I'm beginning to model. All right. Um, so, I'm saying that with a 9x9 nine nine torus, it's a minimum of three nested vortices circuits. So, in other words, if it takes uh, a whole group of these to represent a nested vortice circuit. So this, these three right here would be one nested vortice circuit. Okay, this would be two, then three. Okay, for a nine by nine torus, there's three different nested vortice circuits. They make a total of 18 vortices. This is the most simple that you can do. Uh, they're in three groups of six. So there's six of these. And you can assign a number to each of those vortices. So you can see these smaller diamonds in here are where I was putting my initial numbers, even though they're not written in here. These bigger numbers now that are written on are a number that goes for each nested vortice. But these sequences cannot occur if you only have two conductors. It's impossible and it doesn't, doesn't correlate with this torus. So one or the other has to be correct. This torus is showing that instead of the windings going round and round and round, as I showed in my other video, and you can see this on the more advanced video, that this one's coming in here, it's coming out over here and connecting back to itself. So these are multiple circuits. Each one of these colors represents four different conductors, four different wires, which means in this model I have 12 wires. Um, those various circuits create the phenomena which is being talked about here. Called spires. When you're going in this path or here like this, Every time you cross back at a right angle, that's a spire. Um, so you're getting these polarized fields and you're getting these parallel lines, which we also saw in our initial symbol. We wanted to have those parallel lines. We wanted to have the triangulation. We wanted to have the, essentially the hexagonal shape, this being a 24-sided polygon in the center. If you, this is just a 24-sided you know, based on a hexagon. Um, so you have all your different geometries accounted for. So, so this would seem to be correct. But what's actually happening, these spires are what we're talking about when we talk about these spirals over top. Here's my initial doubling circuits going in. Over top of that, I have these spirals, like this red one you see coming all the way over. And when you look at those spirals, it's kind of interesting because they look and they follow the metric of the spirals we see in nature and shells and the Fibonacci, uh, generally in vortex motion. So you, you can tell right away that there's something highly significant. I actually found the secret of the, of the spires and how they work. They increase in a certain uh, amount depending on how many circuits, how many conductors you're using. So we were talking about the torus, we were talking about circuits and spires. Uh, what, what are we really getting at with all this? What I want to make sure, uh, what I'm, ultimately what I'm going to show you, because what you can do with this number system that makes it unique, is that it's infinite, it's a, it's a 
an infinite way of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's like a diffraction grating. It's like an x-ray into reality. You can scale it from big to small. It's, um, it's like a way to zoom in on reality or to zoom out. And the numbers never move. Everything I'm showing you is stationary. The functions are moving through the numbers, causing the vortices to pass vibration, but they're never um, the numbers themselves are not moving or changing. They are all aspects of this eternal energy, which is a radiant energy causing all vibration and motion. It is the word, if you will. So I want to make sure that everybody understands exactly how to construct the torus. So I'm not I know we, we mentioned other things like layers, spires. All this stuff will come, but it doesn't really mean anything if you don't understand the very basics. So again, if you look at my colored numbers here, um, and then I'm going to explain this in terms of circuits. If you look at the colored numbers, those are all my positive numbers. Different color for every family number group. If you look at the black and white numbers, those are all the negative numbers. Okay. And, um, you know, they're not in different colors for the family number groups, but I just wanted you to see clearly the negative aspect of this. So again, when a positive energy is radiating out, everything is being entrained back in negatively by the vortex. Okay? And um, so all you have to do to build one of these, say I start, if I know where one number is on this map, I know where every number is. That's why it's perfectly coherent. It, it models the way that everything is connected. It's like a, like a crystal lattice structure. So let's say I just have a positive 9 here. I'm able to identify there's a positive 9 here. From that point, I'm going to know where every single other number is. I'm going to know by going up, it's going to be positive 1, positive 2, positive 3, positive 4. I'm going to go going down, this is positive 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. Then, since I know that my 1 and 8s are there, well, I know that moving at an angle, I'm going to have to be doubling. So I'm going to know that's a 2, and I'm going to know it must be negative because this one's positive. Then I'm going to know that's a positive 4. So I can fill in the numbers. Now I see my 4 is here by my 5, so that means there must be a 5 on this side. And then I can do my 5, 10, 15, 20. So I know where that is. As long as I have these doubling circuits, this 693, 396, and my positive and negative are moving in opposite directions. So if I have 1, 2, 3, 4 here, there's 1, 2, 3, 4 there, going in different directions, out and in. Okay, and the, the, the moving in is gravity, it's centering everything. So, I just wanted to review that and make sure that everyone understood that, that you understood whenever you have one of these 1, 2, 4, 8, 7, 5s, we're dealing with one of these nested vortices. It can be flowing in, it can be flowing out, but notice either way, it's still got that right-handed motion. See, they're both ultimately, even though they're shearing against one another, they're moving in the same, um, they're moving in the same overarching direction even though this is going this way and this is going that way. The overarching direction is a one-way flow this way. And so what it really is, is multiple circuits interwoven being phased in a resonance which is highly complex, uh, but based on this simple principle. And that resonance allows these nested vortices to function in a sequence. And when they do, you get all the qualities that you would expect of a vortex. And you can check out my advanced uh, class where I was showing how these are really interlaced doubling circuits. It's highly significant. What that starts to do is create the phenomena of the spires. So, Again, if you look at one of these colors, like say the yellow, that's my doubling circuits going in. And when I have three of them together, I've got what I call a nested vortice circuit. 
So that's that, but across that, cutting across that, are these larger spirals. Still in the same motion. Now I don't have numbers assigned to them here, but that's what this is. You can assign numbers to the vortices, and it gives them a resonance. But how do the spires work? It's really the most fascinating and complex aspect of this is looking at the spires. I'm just going to give you a little bit scratching the surface on how this works. Now one thing I want to show you is here's on a flat sheet of paper uh, I, sh I was doing some other work on this so uh, if you can see these tiny numbers don't pay attention uh, the big numbers are what I'm talking about but you can just take my word for it if you can't see it these are all representing squares of 9 by 9 which I said was the smallest group you could have to make a torus these are the nested vortices sequence orders, which I explained in my other video. Um, depending on how many of these groupings I have is how you understand how many spires you have, which can completely alter how you're building your torus. It brings a lot more complexity into this. The interesting thing is, though, once I assign a pattern to my nested vortices, I can continue to add blocks, groups, of these 9x9 nine nine tiles, and I never have to change any of these numbers. They always intersect with each other perfectly. So it's perfectly scalable. From micro to macro, you can scale these, you can keep adding in numbers, and you're, you, what you get is multiple different circuits. For each time you add a group of 9x9, nine nine, you get another amount of nested of um, nested vortices circuits which are always in multiples of three you get multiples of six in your conductors because for every nested vortices circuit you have two conductors and then there's a gap space so you have six conductors going up in multiples and you add spires in multiples of one now I may have lost everybody with that but I think some of you may follow me. So let's look at it on a flat piece of paper. And see, even though this is tiny, don't worry about seeing the numbers. All you have to just see is the color pattern. Okay, so here is a 9x9 nine nine on a flat sheet. If I connect the ends on either side, I have unbroken uh, multiplication series. So my 1 and 8's on my vertical, my 4 and 5's on my horizontal. I have doubling circuits moving at angles. Okay, so I have all those principles. I have my family number groups all spread out. I don't have any more of any one number than any other number. Um, everything's in equal proportion. So to me, I'm making a true torus. I have a binary flip-flop that's perfect. So I'm making a torus. It's composed of three nested vortices circuits which is six different conductors and the vortices are 18 vortices again and they're in three groups of six. But there's only one spire. The reason why I've colored this all in red is because even though there's 18 vortices here, if you go across the vortices at an angle, which you'll see more easily in these other ones, they're all connected to one spire. So for a 9 by 9 torus, you have one spire. Now as I expand this out, I want you to take into account that I'm also doing the inverse square law, which is really important in mathematics. Also, the regular doubling circuits are modeling the inverse square law. It's what I initially did for you on the symbol. But now I'm doing the inverse square law in numbers of 9 by 9 torus groupings. So in other words, if this is 9 by 9, this is going to be 18 by 18. So where, where I have one square here, I have four here. The next is going to be 27 by 27, which is going to be 9. The next is going to be 36 by 36, which is going to be 16 of those squares. So if you're familiar with the inverse square law, I'm doing the inverse square law, which is 1, 4, 9. I'm sorry, I said 16. It should be, yeah, that's right, 16. It's going to be 16. 
So depending on your grouping, how many of these you have to make a torus, you get more and more spires, and you get more and more conductors, and more nested vortices circuits with different amounts of vortices. So they have to be constructed perfectly and phased perfectly to get the right, uh, right effects. Otherwise, you're cutting across the circuits in a bad way, and the the motion doesn't occur correctly. It's not centered on its axis like it should. And the magnetic fields will be much weaker. All right, so here everything's one spire in a 9 by 9. Now here I have 18 by 18. You can see it's four times the size of this one. All right. Um, so, we're, so if I put one of these, it'd be 1, 2, 3, 4. And now I have two spires. One is my reds here. So if I connected these end to end, what it would really look like, those, that diagonal motion of the red tiles this way, it would look like this. You would be seeing this spiral over the surface of the toroid. So that's what I'm showing you. My regular doubling circuits on this model are, are here. They're going from red to green to red to green. So they're doing the positive, negative, positive, like that. Red to green, red to green. Those are my regular circuits, but my spires are going across. Now, once I do 18 by 18, I'm going to have six nested vortices circuits, and I'm going to have 12 conductors, and I'm going to have two spires. All right, so I'm going to have the red ones and the green ones. And it's very interesting how these spires polarize. It's, it's very significant. It's what's trying to be achieved in the standard rodent coil, but I believe that it, because, of the, because of the additional complexity of this, which is far beyond what's being done, and that it really changes how you have to do it to create the field. Ultimately, what these coils are, aren't even electrical coils. They're field generator coils. What we're looking for is the secret of magnetism. So here, again, is a 27 by 27 now. So all that means is I got 27 on my vertical, 27 on my horizontal. Now with the 27 by 27, where remember I had three nested vortices circuits here, six here. I'm going to have nine nested vortices circuits here, which means I have 18 different wires, 18 conductors polarized. I also have now three spires. I went one, two, three. You can see just the added colors. Went from red to red to green to red to green and orange. So now I have three spires going over the top of the circuit. So you can start to see how this is a clear algorithm. It's, just, it's complete, true, whole number fractal. Interestingly though, while my spires change, just like I was showing you here, or on this map is the same thing, my nested vortices sequence numbers never have to change. It's just that the more you add of these groups of nine, the more spires you get, but the sequence order never changes. So when you're modeling, um, this is really the secret to modeling the atom, doing the periodic table. So I guess I'm giving it away. Um, let me look at this one. Here's a 36 by 36. All right, you've got now I have, uh, I'm going to have 12 nested vortices. Notice my, if I do family number groups too, uh, so if I'm doing family number groups and I say this is one for instance because I have one spire, one group of nine by nine, now when I'm basing it on, anyway, that's, it's too complex for me to say in words what I'm trying to say, which is the relationship of the way that these numbers multiply together. Some are multiples of three, some are multiples of 6, some are multiples of 9, some are multiples of 1. So when you want to model a progression, it's all based on this. This is the way to do it. So back to what I was saying, a 36 by 36, I have now got 12 nested vortices circuits. I've got uh, 24 wire conductors, if you're using wire, or 24 pathways is what I would prefer to say. 
Uh, I don't think that this kind of coil can be built in a standard way. It's going to require a better construction. Um, so I have that many, and now I've got four spires. All right, but I've just been showing you the spires. I could also show you the patterns of how the spires are polarized, and I won't explain this, but here's now my 9x9, nine nine, but I've got two colors representing my positive and negative aspects. And again, these are interlaced, when you put numbers to them, interlaced doubling circuits, um, giving you all your numbers over top of the numbers. <laughs> That makes sense. So here's the positive and negative for 9 by 9. Here's 18 by 18. You just follow the pattern. 27 by 27. This is getting more complex. 36 by 36. It just goes on and on. I have the pattern to scale it from micro to macro to infinity. Okay, I can show you here. This is in base 50. This is a 49 by 49. You can do the same thing. The algorithm always holds up. So this is, in order for you to maintain the principles of your symbol, to have your unbroken multiplication series and circle modeling, truly 3D, to have your doubling circuits, this is the only way you can do it. You have to have a minimum of three nested vortices circuits. Now allows these vortices to sequence. When they do, you can get this effect. This is the electrical venturi. Okay, as the doubling circuits are winding in this yin-yang pattern, which I showed in my other video, you get these spires going over, and notice they're always in quadrature. All my threes are here in quadrature. My sixes are here in quadrature. My fours are here. So as the number groups and the vortices are sequencing, you actually are still maintaining this pattern of the spires, but they're along this arc of the, the, uh, this logarithmic spiral. So it's a much more complex sequence. I do have it. I have the understanding of the sequence to make perfect mirror imaging and to be able to construct any coil and any multiple of this and to connect it with every single geometry. That's basically what I found. You can do every single geometry simultaneously by modeling these emanations and their over interlacing spirals. Okay, let me go back a little bit more basic. Uh, so that I want to make sure that everybody understands the basic aspects of this before we get into the really complex stuff that I'm modeling now. Um, one question is, uh, well first I just want to make sure everybody is understanding what's going on with the torus here. What are we talking about? We're talking about the ultimate most powerful vortex, the philosopher's stone if you will. It's like a source of unlimited energy. Marco describes it better than I can on his videos. Um, and I want to make sure everybody understands what we're talking about when we talk about circuits. Now, it's pretty clear here, I think this is like a wire being wound. And on this torus, you know, you're sewing a circuit coming in. Well, you can't see it once it goes through the center. But because of the way the math is, this is the first math that's been able to take you through the center of the hole inverting, coming out upside down, and back around, and, and I figured out how to calculate on that to know where every different number is at any given time without even having to be able to see it in 3D. I can, I can do it in my head now, it's really easy. But instead of this all being one circuit that went all the way around to connect to itself, it's really multiple circuits. So if you, just to make sure you understand, what I'm showing on this model is my, what I said was a circuit. It's 124875 from a 147 family number group. All right, that's what I mean with a binary triplet. It's binary, positive, negative, positive, negative, but it's a, actually a synchronized triplet of your 147. It's the same with every family number group, whether it's 396 or 285. 
Okay, it's going in, three, coming out, six. And so when I say circuit, I'm just talking about a pathway of motion. So what you're seeing in a straight line here, it really should be at an angle. Really what it is, is one of these coming in like this. And the other one's coming out like this. And in between is a space, which is where the etheron flux field occurs. All right, that's how you allow the magnetic field to breathe and to let it pulse and work. So, I'm saying on the smallest torus you can have, it's not uh, just two, circuit, two conductors. And it's a minimum of six conductors. All right? that's, all, that's the minimum you can have to have unbroken multiplication series, to have one interconnected spire, uh, and that go up in the multiples as I was saying. So when we talk about circuits, we're just talking about the way the energy is phasing in, the way that it's going out, and the proportion that it has to be in to allow the field to occur. Now, the idea with all the numbers being in proportion is that if you create the electricity f per se, you get the magnetism, which we already know, and more importantly, you get the etherons is the only energy higher than the known elements okay, that we can model perfectly in this mathematics. But if you only have one circuit going all the way around, you cannot get your unbroken multiplication tables, which means when we're talking about quantum numbers, you don't get this lining up. You cannot have the shearing. Uh, even the principles of the coil cannot work. All right, but these coils are designed just like our DNA. They're designed to conduct, to conduct energy. All right, they're designed for efficiency, for speed. Your brain is like this. So the circuit's going this way, going out. This model here is based on, as I showed in my other video, a 36 by 18. So I want to make sure that everybody understands that concept of how to build a torus. You have to start with your mathematical fingerprint. We call it a mathematical fingerprint of God. This is a small one, but you can, you can get your own. You can, all it has to be is 9 by 9 squares. You have to have 162 tiles to make it. Okay, and then, um, and I'll just, again, I know I read some of these, but I want you to understand the concept of what I'm saying, um, to see that it's not just a matter of me having a wrong number. Okay, what well, I'm going to start off, because I want we're talking about ratios, proportions, so when we do our axes, and remember every multiplication series, is modeling an axis of spatial orientation. Uh, so, if I, when I say even numbers, I'm talking about 9 by 9, 18 by 18, 27 by 27, 36 by 36, uh, and that is, um, what was I saying? I don't know. Anyway, so if we go 9 by 9, um, I'm saying there's three nested vortices circuits. So let me again go over what is a nested vortice circuit. Whereas my regular doubling circuits, I have a 1, 2, 4, 8, 7, 5 going in here, 1, 2, 4, 8, 7, 5 coming out here, my 3, 9, 6 in the middle. This, which is 9, 6, 6, 9, 3, that is a nested vortice circuit. On a torus like this, which is 36 by 18, there are six of those with 12 conductors. But it works like this. If you do a 9 by 9, you can have all the principles of your symbol. You're going to have three nested vortice circuits. They do always connect back to themselves. You're going to have 18 vortices over the surface. Uh, they're going to be six conductors. So if you're making a coil with this, based on this, uh, on this quantum mechanical version of it, if you want to say, 
um, you're going to have to have a minimum of six different conductors. Now, ultimately, I think it should be done in a better form than with wires and plastic donuts like that. You have to be able to preserve the curvature, and I talked about that in my other video. So for three nested vortices circuits, there are 18 of these nested vortices, which give this spin orientation, which make it perfect, make it mirror. I believe they create vortices that go all the way through. Um, so 9 by 9 is 3 nested vortices circuits. 18 of those vortices, they're in 3 groups of 6. You have 6 circuits. You have 1 spire. All right? And that spire, of course, consists of 18 vortices. For an 18 by 18, again, just following my inverse square law, I have 6 nested vortices circuits. 72 vortices. 12 circuits. And they're in 6 groups of 12. And then I have two spires. So there's 36 vortices per spire. I make 72 vortices. Uh, I'll just say two more. I got 27 by 27, nine nested vortices circuits, 162 vortices. There are nine groups of 18, 18 circuits, 18 conductors. That makes three spires with 54 vortices in each spire. So I, I hope everybody follows that. You can, you know, go along, carry them on yourself. It gets really interesting the more you make the combinations of the numbers. You see how the spires change and how the torus evolves as it collects more of this etheron energy um, if it can maintain stability and resonance. All right. So you can also do them in different ratios. They don't have to be nine by nine could be 9 by 27 or 9 by 36 where I just had nine numbers on my vertical but I had 36 across my horizontal which would make a long narrow torus but whatever the smallest number is in other words if it's 9 uh, I'm only going to have one spire on that so a 9 by 36 even is just going to have one spire Whereas an 18 by 36, or an 18 by anything, is going to have two spires. So that's with my ratio being half, but it's a totally different number of circuits, totally different number of vortices. Every, the, those numbers are always changing, but you never have to shift anything's position. And you don't ever have to change or fudge or account for anything that's missing. They always line up in a perfect sequence, which I think I clearly demonstrated in my other video. Um, there's a lot more you can go into this in terms of how this relates to various geometries, tetrahedrons, pyramids. I found a way that you can model all of it through the emanations of the torus. And by understanding the interconnection of your circuits, your spires, um, and by the way, my spires are always unbroken sequences too. Um, how they create the interlaced doubling circuits, how you can do that in various layers of the torus. Um, since making this discovery, I've just taken it so far so fast. Um, I wanted to share the basic aspects of it so that everyone can start working on it on their own. Um, but I am interested in teaching on it further. Um, if, if people have questions and they write in, I will try to post up what other information I can. My basic goal in this was to really just explain the basic symbol here. Um, to explain that basic symbol, how it worked, and what its principles are. All of that's already been covered even on, on Marco's videos, but I really wanted to get it ingrained because if you can't understand these principles, then doing the complex aspects of inter, uh, interweaving these circuits and understanding the spire sequences um, and how the mirror image works and how the vortices work, um, I just think that you will 
you will always falter in that without this basic understanding. So I spent a long time just working on this before I even got to any of that. Um, but we would like to see some prototypes be built. Um, and I'm mostly more interested in teaching on the mathematics. I've gone through uh, a lot of physics, all the various equations, and can connect it with this and show the whole number relationships. So, uh, you know, I'm working now to model periodic table, and I'm interested to hear, in, you know, everybody's comments on all this work. Uh, we went from uh, the simple to the highly complex today. Ultimately, what we are talking about here, um, to me, is even something totally different, which is uh, when you get into the spiritual or the philosophical aspects of this. So all those are good topics. We hope to explain them further in videos. I just want everybody today to get an understanding basically of how to build a toroid. How many numbers do you need? You know, uh, how many tiles do you have to have? You have to be really thorough when you're doing this. So you can do, the, I, I showed you how to multiply them. You know, your basic 9x9 nine nine toroid, you have to make sure, you know, the common mistake is that you don't account for all your positives and negatives. But in your basic 9x9 nine nine toroid, you're going to have 162 tiles. All right? And we didn't even get into how you can turn them into hexagons and triangles. There's a lot more there in how you can create the matrix. We've only really looked at the diamonds. Um, but you need 162 tiles with the 18 vortices and the six conductors. All right, so that's the minimum you can have. And now you can work on your own permutations. I think I've given you enough that you can build out the toruses for yourself. You can try the various ones, the two seven toruses. We just looked at one and eight. We could do two seven, we could do four or five. You can make layers on this, like layers of an onion skin. And I even found out how to make doubling going in towards the center um, so that you can model it on every single axis. Um, so if anybody also has computer skills and like to do animations, um, interested in communicating with people on that as well. I'm really trying to teach this to generate the understanding. So I really want to hear from people who are just looking to get a grasp on this. How does it apply to things in life? And I will try to keep posting more videos uh, connecting with that or hopefully doing seminars where working one-on-one -on -one, or not necessarily one-on-one -on -one, but working in person you can definitely get a lot deeper into this and the more we get 3D models the more we can really show how it's functioning but the um, way that I have it with the circuits I believe is the key to understanding this to being able to model uh, different types of atoms to really get a hold of electrical motion, magnetism. And that was initially our goal here. So I hope everyone has enjoyed the video. I'm getting hoarse now, so I'm going to stop. But we'll see you later. Peace.